Welcome to As the World Works. Tonight we're going to have a lot of fun. In fact, you would call this a double feature because uh, we have a duo of talent as our special guest tonight, but we'll save the second one as a surprise here in a little bit. Right now, I want to go back a little bit in my history. I'm not making it about me, but just so you know, I went to a little private school in Addison, Texas when I was in high school called Trinity Christian Academy. A lot of people that were, will be the alumni or currently live in Dallas know it as TCA. And back in the day, I was uh, kind of this cocky, insecure, didn't know myself hunk of a materialistic kid. <laughs> and my that's just because I was a pleaser and trying to fit in. And that's probably why I love the movie The Breakfast Club so much. Um, and I always admired people who were outside of the box, uh, <laughs> literally. And so uh, when I was walking down the hall um, every day, I would look into this one particular room and it was the art class. And they were doing photography and pottery and art and everybody seemed to be free and happy and exploring their talent. So in fact, just recently, I had a, a, a student that I went to school with say to me, seeing some stuff I've done over the last several years, said, I didn't know you had a creative bone in your body. And I said, I didn't either. I had no idea, but I saw people who did. And so over the last several years, I have, I have followed uh, my special guest tonight, uh, my first special guest, uh, for years on Facebook. And I, one of the things he posted was creativity takes courage. Creativity takes courage. I didn't have that courage back then. It took a lot of suffering and a lot of life experience to um, understand what that meant for me personally. But I always had an impact from the head of fine arts at TCA, who is my guest tonight, very special guest. Wally Linebarger. Hello, Wally. Hey, how you doing, Sam? I'm doing better now that I see your happy face. Yeah, it's so great. I, I, I love talking to you. This is amazing. I, you know, the internet may have some issues, you know, but this is the this is what makes it worthwhile. Sam, you know, I've got a correct you on one thing you said. You said that you didn't think you were talented. And I did teach you, you did have art with me one year, I believe. And did you take photography? I didn't. I didn't. You were just I, in I, there all the time, weren't later. you? You were in the photo lab a lot, I think. That's why I remember you in the photo that classroom, right? Yeah, okay. I would come in the photo lab but, and watch the process, but I didn't get it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what's so weird about what you said is you were talented. I remember some of your drawings. I do. I, I remember these things, but you, you were in a school full of super talented people. And when you compare yourself to those, I mean, it's like me comparing myself to Billy Joel or something, you know, or Picasso or somebody like that. I mean, I think that's why it maybe had felt for you like you weren't talented. But, you know, that's not true. That's not true. Well, and I also need to say one more thing. That little school in Texas that you went to is now the largest private school in the nation, by the way. Really? The I didn't yeah. Know Have that. you been by there recently? I've, yes, I've driven by and seen how explosive the, you know, the campus has grown. Right. Yeah. Like I so. went for a big art reception a couple of years ago and um, I got lost. And I taught there 15 years. I got lost. I got totally lost. I didn't know where I was. I had to be guided. That was embarrassing. You know, that was like, I helped design that school, you know, so I knew where every nick and cranny was. So it was kind of amazing. That is amazing, and you actually uh, were the grassroots of that whole development of that department, so good on you. I will tell you, to Thanks. your point, there were, um, I remember the millets, I remember 
you know, a girl in my class, Kristen Cruz, and some other people that, that just really, and she's teaching art now for students. And so the seed that you planted was a seed beyond what I think a person can comprehend, except for the response that I'm sure you've seen over the years for your work and your soul and your spirit. You went on to uh, Ursuline Academy, Arts Magnet, Booker T, higher ed teaching. You're an SMU alumni. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's our alma mater, by the way. We both have our BFAs from there. Um, and so when did you discover your passion and your calling? For teaching? For teaching. For art. For art and oh, for art? Oh, no, Sam. That's like asking me when I remember the first breath I took. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was making art and music. I wrote my first song on the piano when I was four years old. Wow. You know, I was drawing, I was reading, I was very sick as a child and I had to stay in the hospital and in my room a lot. And I couldn't play outside like I wanted to. I, I snuck out to play. I got grounded once for playing, for playing outside. Anyway, and that always confused me. As it, but I read a lot. I was exposed to a lot. My parents bought me Encyclopedia Britannica, World Book, Childcraft. I had all these. I read through A to Z all the, the by the time I was in like, second grade I read the entire encyclopedia three different encyclopedias and that's yeah I know I know I mean I'm so stupid now and I go god I was really smart as a kid what happened <laughs> so my passion for art see I was going into pre-med at SMU that was my original intention but when I got there the biology class was already closed so the only science class left was geology. And I'm embarrassed to say, because I went to SMU as a straight A kind of student, I flunked geology lecture and made an A in lab because you had to draw, so that was an A. So I'd average to a C. <laughs> My parents were like, what's a C? So I was pre for like one semester. And then I my my passion really has always been either art or music or both simultaneously. And I was chicken to be in a music major. I knew that would require amazing type of, not just talent, but opportunities, you know? I mean, you know how that is in the music industry. It's so tough and it scared me. And I wanted to be a bohemian artist in New York City. I mean, that was my, that was my thought. I was a total hippie. I mean, I was, this was 1970, you know, so SMU was a lot different back then, too. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you stories, okay, child, I got, I was a president of the student body my junior year when I went off to, uh, to Spain to school for one, one year, and then the next year I came back and I was a vice president of the student activities directorate, which was in charge of all the entertainment. Movies, music, art exhibits, speakers, everything, homecoming, oh my God, at SMU. And I was vice president, and the president, well, I just thought, you know, great guy, uh, he had the keys to every single room in the entire university. So we did things up on the top of Dallas Hall and all kinds of stuff. That was a while. Your SMU was different. So art and being a hippie just were like, I mean, there was no difference. But I mean, SMU was different too, right? I mean, there's oh a, whole, there's a the whole different Yeah, I'm world. still wearing bell bottoms, okay? <laughs> that my my <laughs> ex-wife and I, when we met, uh, it was kind of a blind date setup. But uh, I had on a pair of red, white, and blue seersucker bell bottoms. And she said, when I walked through the door, she went, oh, my God, this guy's a total freak. You know, and when we got married, those were the first things she threw away, by the way. She snuck in my closet and threw away all my hippie clothes. She hated those. 
And that was what I, I mean, I have photographs. You've probably seen that one of me with the wild Afro and I'm wearing the overalls with the painted mushroom. Do yeah. you know who painted that mushroom? Who? It was, uh, what was the guy that was the big uh, uh, Heisman Trophy winner in the 40s football player, uh, what's his name? Duke Walker? Uh, Yes, Doug Walker. Doug Walker, Doug Walker. His, his daughter, Lori, was an art major, too. And she's the one that painted that much. It was Doug Walker's. And see, when she told me that Doug was her father, I had no idea who he was. She I mean, like, what's football? Football. football. <laughs> you know, like, what is football? Is that the one with the bat? No, that's not that. <laughs> no, I played. Ba I was a baseball player, so. And soccer, but I was my two sports. So you were you're talking about uh, Billy Joel a minute ago. What are the yeah. constants in your world? I know this music is is big in my world, right? I mean, it drives sort of when I'm doing right. stuff. It's just constant. It doesn't matter. I, I've got just wide swath of everything from, you know, the Bee Gees to Hank Williams or rap or whatever. I, you know, just... There's a lot of stuff that just uh, sort of lights my fire. What are the constants in your work is a big question I have for you. Music, politics, religion, art, culture, or is it just kind of all morphs together? Yeah, yes. The answer is yes, what you just said. <laughs> it's all morphed. I'm very, um, you know, I've been self-quarantined to my, my property, my home and my yard since the end of January. Anywhere. I have had experiences with viruses in my life, and when I heard it hit outside of China, I immediately went into soldier mode. I, my father was a retired military man. He was in the he was in the army, and he worked at the Pentagon. So I was raised this freak child. I mean, what did he? I'm sure he was so like, what am I going to do with Wally? But here I was like this more amorphic morph, you know, like the morph dwarf or whatever. And uh, he was military, so he trained me, but I went into, I can go into total soldier lockdown mode. It's, I have no problem with going from freak to freaky like hippie to freaky like military. So I've been self-quarantined and I haven't been bored one single day because my life is filled, if you can see, projects everywhere in my little room, everywhere, piles of projects. Oh, yeah. And I have them everywhere in my house. So I'm never bored. I always have something to do. I constantly read. I constantly research. I, I've been watching way too much TV. TV. That you works. know, I mean, streaming, streaming TV is amazing. I've seen, seen some of the, right now I'm work, walk, watching Utopia. So, I mean, that's an amazing show. So, talked to my cousin so, today and he's on his third binge watch of the Golden Girls. Oh my gosh, yes. I know my daughter, Sarah, who you might know, uh, remember her. She was a, uh, she is a Golden Girls fanatic. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned viruses along the way and struggles. How does that, uh, if you want to go into that, we can talk about it. But if I have, uh, no, I have no boundaries on conversation, let's talk about um, let's talk about when you left Trinity and what what was that about? You left Trinity and you you went on and I don't know. You're you want to know why I left Trinity? I do. Okay, I was outed. <sighs> by one of the teachers and it wasn't because I was out it they found out because of gossip mm. through one of my wife's friends and used to be my best friends and uh, she outed me both at Trinity and then when I f was fired for being gay at Trinity I went to Ursuline and then before I ever started the first day she had already had her neighbor, who's Catholic, send a registered mail to the nuns telling them that I had been fired at Trinity for, for being gay and that if, if they hired me, if they kept me after this letter, that I, they were doomed to hell. And the first day of in service, the nuns called me in. I was like, what is this about? And they go, the nuns never call in new faculty. What's this about? I said, I don't know. 
I sat down at this big table, one of those big conference tables with all the nuns, and they handed me these two manila envelopes. And I read the letters and I just went, I looked up, I went, that was my first day of in-service. I mean, it was like, I just went, oh, sh I mean, inside I was going, oh shit, I'm fired already before I start, okay. So I looked at, you know what they, huh? Number two. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and anyway, do you know what they said to me? And think of a better place for a gay man to teach than an all girls school. They said, we actually have more trust in you than we do some of our straight faculty. How about that? Yeah. And so you received loving open arms and then you stayed and there for, for the a while, first, right? Um, for the first several years and when the principal was fired for being a lesbian, which was weird because she's the one that hired me. And then when they fired her, I was like, oh no, it's getting ready to happen again. But they waited for a couple of years. And when I was let go at Ursuline, it was the most difficult, it was much, it was a hundred times worse than at Trinity. I was expecting to leave Trinity. I had already planned on leaving Trinity, taking a leave of absence. It was already planned. My wife and I had already worked it out. And when I was at it, that blew my plan. So it was gonna be no, you know, no drama. You just, you know, I was taking leave of absence, no big deal. I've done it before, so no biggie. Anyway, so I get to Ursuline and the, I'd been there four years. And that weekend, do you remember Taps that played? That was the organization for all the football and it also yeah. arts and, and academics. Well, Trinity had won it 15 years in a row for art, 15 years straight for art. So my goal when I got to Ursuline was I'm going to beat those. Yeah, I'm going to beat them. <laughs> It took me four years. The fourth year, we beat Trinity. We won state. How about and that? that was that weekend. And I got to school Monday morning after winning state on Saturday, Sunday, Saturday. And then Monday, I found out from one of my students that we won the National Catholic Art Competition. She was only a ninth grader. So I walked into the office when the principal said she needed to talk to me. I thought they were going to give me a raise, right? She said, I'm going to have to let you go. I'm not hiring you back. And I was in, I mean, I was expecting a crown. And instead, I got the rug. And I said, why? She said, and this is all I know to this day, Sam. It will drive me crazy for the rest of my life until I find out the truth. She said, you're probably the best teacher we have at this school, but I have to let you go. And I said, but why? And she said, she, she sat there a long time. She goes, well, I don't have to tell you. If I was firing you, I would, but since I'm just not hiring you back for next year, private schools have, they don't break a contract, they get a new contract every year. Mm. She said, I said, but, but come on, you know, you've got to tell me something professionally to help me. What did I do wrong? And she gave me the answer. And it was so confusing to me. I was like, what are you talking about specifically? She said, because I was too open. Mm. I and said, you mean honest? You mean honest, you mean truthful? Yeah. She goes, yes. She said, yes. Interesting. And I had never made an issue about my sexuality. The girls, there were other gay teachers at that school. I wasn't the only one. I so never knew you, why I was fired you, over there. That's a hard thing because there's so many instances in my life that I don't know the why of other people. And then it questions your own why. When you get to... You want to talk, so what are the top struggles in your life that like that, that have driven your, and, and there's a point to this. I'm not just asking this superfluously to like sort of create conversation. This is from an artist to an artist perspective. I mentioned earlier that those were the moments that drove me further, deeper into my work, into my internal work that expressed outwardly, right? And this is part of why I'm doing this. Um, 
as a contribution, but also from the instance of this quarantine, right? Of how can I use something that I know I have right here, my voice to tell a message to the world and share these stories that people who have impacted my life have had. So uh, we can talk about struggles or some of the big moments that have been, you know, uh, you know, those, those uh, turning points in your life that have changed you dramatically? Uh, I always say I've had at least six lives. I mean, seriously, I, when you ask me that, I can answer by five or six because my life has constantly, drastically changed from like being a hippie and then two years later, I'm in Barcelona going to school and I become a born again Christian on Montserrat at the top of the mountain and the only Gregorian chapel in Europe that still performs. I mean, so my experiences have just been like really up and really down. So I've had a lot of those. So that was a big one, becoming a Christian. And then when I decided when I found out that I had a gift for teaching, I didn't want to be a school teacher. That was like, ew, I hated my teachers, you know, most of them. I loved so many, I mean, it was either love or hate. Uh, my music teachers all were fabulous. My third grade teacher will always be my favorite, Miss Lister. She taught me Spanish in third grade. And I still, I was, I tested out of Spanish at SMU. Now, so, are you still, uh, was this in Jefferson uh, City? Was City, there, yeah. Yeah. I lived there 18 years, or 17 and a half. And I said, I would never come back. Never, never. As a matter of fact, my best friends to this day, they still say, Wally, you really are like an alien here. You not belong in this town. Where, oh, where you're are back. You? That's right. And I you're was back. so affected by this all the time, you know? And then just last year, uh, let me get you something. Excuse me for one second. Okay. I keep this, I keep this in my bathroom to remind me, okay? okay. I'll show it to you in just a second. But his name is John Weidler. I've known him since fourth grade. We lived around the corner. I've known him. He's still just an amazing, he lives in Colorado, but he and his wife are two of my favorite people. But he said to me on the phone last year, he goes, well, you are the weirdest person I know. And I said, John, you can't, weird. And I was thinking of all the pink hair, nose ring tattooed, weird for bird people I know. And he <laughs> said, I was weirder than them. I said, John, you don't really mean that I'm the weirdest. He goes, Oh, yes, I do. You are the weirdest person I've ever known. And I just was like, so I just didn't say anything. We hung up. I was friendly, but I, then I finally said, I called him back going, John, what do you mean weird? He goes, you know, unique. <laughs> I went, Thank you. Oh, that's Thank all. You. That's unique all. is all. Okay, but he sent me this. He made it for me. Can you read it? Uh, Patrick, well, you got to scoot it over the other way a little bit. Oh, this way? Yeah. This, the trick to, the trick it, just read it. I don't have my readers on. What does it say? Yeah, okay, I'll read it. The trick is to not let people know how really weird you are until it's too late for them to back out. Ah. And so I have this by the mirror, reminding myself that some people look at me as the weirdest person they know, and I really have to tone it down. And I and it's really hard for me to tone it down, Sam. I think and, I think you're a pioneer, though. I think you you live you live uh, fearlessly, yeah. just by conversation. I can I hear your story and think about um, now that you're the owner. Uh, well, it takes a lot of courage to move back to. Um, your hometown too, right? Let's not go <laughs> there. Okay. Like, this is in this case, this, the weird factor. The six months I intended to stay here has turned into fourteen years. Okay, so 
I find I'm coming back just for six months to help out with my dad who was dying of Alzheimer's. I was just going to stay till, you know, after he passed and then I would go back to Dallas or New York or somewhere. But that didn't happen. Let's dance around for a little bit. We're going to chase a bunch of rabbits. Um, Now you're the owner master artist at Mindscapes Art Studio. Right, which is the it, you, I used to actually. I'm looking have, at it right now. Oh, I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. I said I I'm looking to, at it right now because I see some of the art back there. Oh yeah, some of it. That's my newest piece. Can you see that? I can. You know what okay. I see in your work, which is interesting. I've never noticed before. You have a lot of Salvador Dali in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Like maybe this. Here's my clock. This is what I was. This is what my use for my clock. Oh, see, there the melting you go. Clock. There see? it is. Yep. You see it? Nice. Yes. So I have it. This is what I use. Salvador. Yeah, Salvador Dali was my first artist I ever fell in love with. Yes. <laughs> Good observation. What about music? Uh, we, let's go back to music for a second. You mentioned a band the other day that is your all time favorite. And then I have a question about did you ever go to Studio 54? Uh, uh, only in my trips only in my mind no no but i have i've watched that i've watched several things on studio you know it, it's definitely fabulous but no so yeah so you're talking about 70s hippie to disco how was that transition for you did you dive oh, in or were you resistant were you like totally yeah. resistant hated disco hated 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 disco wow. now i love it wow. now i love it but, were you like no, in the Bob Dylan, uh, Randy Newman? Were you like yes. uh, Bruce this? Coburn is one of my? Do you know who Bruce Coburn is? No. I got oh okay. He did. Uh, he had a one. He's only had one hit in America called "I Wonder Where the Lions Are." Oh, I, I love his song. Okay, yeah. But his other his body work is phenomenal. He also did "If I Had a Rocket Launcher." From the 80s? No, okay. Uh, anyway, I got to see him in New York uh, when I was teaching up there. That was like, oh my God, I saw him at Beaker Street Theater, you know, um, trippy. But anyway, Mike, you know you know the story about Billy Joel, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I met yeah. Billy Joel. No, I didn't. I don't know your story with Billy you Joel. You don't know about my story? No. When I was, I yeah. told you I was with uh, Student Activities directed, directed at SMU in charge of all the entertainment. They sent me to, an, to the National Entertainment Conference in Kansas City from Dallas. So um, I was in there and we went to concerts every night and saw movies and we were booking these for college okay they were intended to book well i got this flyer this friend of mine we got this flyer in the street during a lunch day one day and it said come upstairs to the president hotel for a free concert and free lunch and those two things just sounded perfect so we went up there were only about seven or eight of us up there and the guy came out and performed his music and because and he was so phenomenal and afterwards he uh, he I I told him I, he he talked to us because it was like just like eleven people after the band, the band seven people, you know. So we got to talk and I hung out with him for a few hours and then I ended up spending the whole week with him, like going out to parties and stuff. But he taught me how to play one of his songs, She's Got Away. He taught me how to play it. Yeah, that was Billy Joel. And we were pen pals for a couple of years. He sent me albums. We were friends for a while. And he was. It was this during the Christy Brinkley days, too, right? Oh, it was way before. Way before. This is when he was still married to Elizabeth. Do you know, here's one little piece of trivia. I don't know if you knew this or not, but you share a common uh, big fan uh, love for Billy Joel with one of the other guys who had kind of a a big impact on me higher learning wise was uh, the dean of Trinity at the time. Actually, he was not the dean. He was, uh, he taught religion and English, Dan Russ. Uh, Dan never told me that. Dan was the hugest Billy Joel fan. 
I've ever met in my life. Never. Oh no, he's not. No, How about no, that? no, no, he's not. I can. I will. I will challenge Dan Russ in a Billy Joel trivia contest. Okay, next, next. When you I want will to put you guys together on this because yeah, I'm pretty I would love sure. To see Dan. Dan and I have been friends for a long time. He came up. Yeah. He and his wife came up to visit me when we were teaching at in uh, the Stony Brook School on Long Island. Yeah. His daughter Libby went there. The senior year, so I was there. Libby was there. Uh, Bill Kiley, do you know Whitney or Bill Kiley? No, I think they were younger. Yeah, these were. You, you knew the Broadies, though, right? Yeah, I was in school with Vince, and he went to Stony Brook. He yeah. left in, uh, the year before I came, so yeah. he graduated the year before I came. That's right. He left the mark. He left a very. Um, when I got there, I heard all kinds of things about Vince Brody. So it was like, whoa, he was president of the student body. Yeah, and he had sense. very, uh, very strong political views that he was overt about in, in his position. So he was famous. He was, he's still famous, probably. Yeah, he's got a big tech company. He went on to Brown University. Yeah, the Brodies were, um, they were very close friends of ours. But Dan Russ was one of those guys, Dr. Russ, who uh, was just a humble, you know, guy that taught English and religion. My senior year, I would sit at his feet. We would have pizza and we would chase rabbits on everything. And he actually taught, know that, me, Sam. He taught me how to think. I wouldn't have made it through college. That's a big thing when someone teaches you how to think at 18, uh, critical thinking. So anyway, yes, we're going to get together and have that trivia challenge. Let me ask you another question. Um, what lights your fire? Uh, music, music yeah. that I have, I have, uh, I've become obsessed with one performer in particular over the last two years. As a matter of fact, I write his blog, huh. uh, scary pool party, Alejandro Aranda from American Idol. Where are they out of now? Where is he? Uh, he's in Pomona, California. Nice for him. He's with, uh, uh, um, Hollywood records. Anyway, he's just released uh, his second album since American Idol. He's already got two albums. He's on, he was there last year. And he's How'd already you got How did you guys hook up? Have you never heard his music? I will send you a link. Uh, he's got his new album, I think, is the best album of the millennium so far. I did and what, it was, So where did you guys meet? We've never met. Oh, I got you. You're just. I, well, uh, I mean, I, I've been in the same space with him because I, I flew up to New York City last summer to see my daughter, and I also had tickets. I one of the one of the people that knew I was a fan, a huge fan, who I never met before. This couple, actually, you might know who it is. Goody Goodman, the music producer, produced Madonna. Do you know who sure, Goody Goodman is? Yeah, Mark, I know the name. His name is Mark Goody Goodman. Look him up. He worked with uh, uh, Vasquez, uh, Junior Vasquez. Do you know him? He, he did a lot of the mixes in the 80s. So anyway, um, but anyway, they, they she bought me a ticket to the concert in New York. And I, it was like, uh, see, I was we were standing room and it was squeezed but I I got there early I was in the very front row I could have touched his foot if I wanted to and I did want to by the way but I mean I was like weird 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 okay <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't do it. but there's uh, something about his music that has touched a spiritual side of my life that I've been needing so badly because one thing, I don't know if you're aware that in, 90s, in 1996, I was given the prognosis that I would be walking again within seven years. I would be in a wheelchair because of a disease in my back. No, I didn't know that. What is it? Anyway, it's called lumbar disease, but it's also, they also found out I had scoliosis and polio. I had had polio. And so I had all, and my, they said my back looked like dinosaur bones. They literally used the word dinosaur bones, my doctor. Your back looks like dinosaur bones. I was like, what does that mean? Anyway, I've seen it since. I, anyway, so 
to make a very long story short, this past year, I had back surgery in December of 2018. And so I was confined in one of those body taco shells, you know, that I couldn't, I had to, I could Velcro up it. It was pretty wild. For six months I wore that, but anyway, I was pretty much confined. And of course, once again, TV. And I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't even set up to do computer work or anything. So I could listen to me. I watched American Idol and heard his audition, which has gone viral. I, I think he has had 21 million. But anyway, his music just like immediately. I was like, whoa, I had never heard anybody play. And I've, I've been to Eric Clapton. I saw late. I heard him play later when he was with Dale, Derek and the time. I mean, Stevie Winwood. I mean, these people are fabulous. But he's the best I've ever heard. And his music, his new album is just amazing. So I'll send you a link. I'll send you a copy. I'll give you a yeah. copy. That's uh, when something does that, uh, changes kind of everything from a cellular level. Well, let me level, tell you right? what happened. What's let me that? tell you. His music, within three months, I had been in, after the surgery, I, was, I had full walking abilities. And within six months, I took it off. I was able to work in the garden for the first time in two years. That's amazing. And it was something with his music had healed me. So I researched it and found out there is sonic therapy for people with issues, certain issues that sound waves can actually heal your bone. Anyway, his music healed me physically. How are you feeling now? Uh, I have bad days and good days. Yeah. I, I, I don't have any all good days. I usually have parts of every day is good. But it, it's a... I, I've been dealing with, you know, I've struggled with a little bit of depression because I feel so unproductive right now. I think we all do, right? Yeah. It's hard. Absolutely. Sure. It's brutal. And, and especially, I, I came up here uh, 14 years ago and I expected to die within a few years because I had been diagnosed with HIV in 2001. And the, at the time, there was no there was no medication and so i just assumed and everybody I knew died i mean i've lost hundreds and hundreds of friends in dallas yeah. Yeah. from this and uh so i go to i go come up here expecting to die take care of my dad and get my business in order and i did and then they came out with the cocktail and now i mean i was supposed to be dead like 10 years ago and i'm still so I, now I'm like, what am I going to do now? There's a line in a song by Dan Fogelberg. One of my, uh, you would think, but anyway, the song is called Netherlands. And there's a line in it that says, what do you do when you come to the end of your dreams? Mm. That's where I was. I really have achieved way far beyond anything I expected. My a, friend life mine, a friend of mine, uh, Joe Pacchetti in Dallas, he's a jeweler, big jeweler. If you know His name is familiar somehow, but anyway. Uh, yeah, you'd recognize him. We're going to have a conversation here shortly okay. uh, on the podcast, but he's always got uh, like, you know, bedazzled in insane jewelry, jewels yeah, and I, stars I, and so forth. But he okay, also yes. is a big advocate here, uh, runs the uh, AIDS Resource Center in Dallas or is a, is a big donor of that. And so, um, yeah, I've known several, uh, numerous friends that died of AIDS and numerous friends who fortunately they came up with a cocktail. And so I'm very thankful that you made it. Um, I will say, <laughs> I have a, <laughs> this is funny. Um, <laughs> when you were talking a minute ago about uh, all these bands and uh, back in school in the 70s, uh, I can edit this too because it's not live. So I'm going to ask you this question. What is your, what was your biggest trip? Are you mean acid trip? Whatever. Well, Any that's, uh, I, I've got answers for all kinds of trips. So do you have anything specifically in no, mind? What was, like, what, what was your, what was your okay, wildest I mean, trip? Okay, Sam, I'm going to be honest. 
My friends, as in, I never smoked marijuana or done any drugs, okay? I was a clean boy when I went off to SMU, and, except for drinking, okay? But anyway, um, they tried, all of my friends were trying to get me to smoke pot, smoke, I mean, months. I finally smoked it, and I liked it. And then later on, they wanted me to do psilocybin and mescaline and acid and stuff. So I finally did acid. They just put it on my tongue, and then they left me. And I ended up going to the cafeteria, and I was sitting with my friends from the floor, and I looked down at my big piece of roast beef, and it was looking at me. And I was like, oh, my God. So I... I very quickly excused myself, and that night was definitely the most, I mean, there have been good trips, and, but this one was really scary. But the thing is, that was when, I will never forget, I looked in the mirror, and that's like something they tell you ever to do when you're tripping, never look in the mirror. <laughs> but I saw myself for the first time, and that's when I said, I'm not terrible. I'm not horrible. I'm not a mistake. I'm not a mess. And that was the point. And I know that's not something you want. To, I don't tell my students that. But that trip helped me to do self. I think I've even heard, what is it? Um, who in the, uh, the Silicon Valley? Was it Tim or was it, who was it that said they tripped when they were inventing Apple? Are you, you know, talking about, what? yeah, Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve. It was Steve Jobs. And see, that's been my experience, too. One of my close friends, uh, DJ Brandel, is an artist. He makes uh, amazing woodwork all by hand, uh, you know, to, to, true, true to tradition. Um, is, he had a, uh, his first trip with mushrooms in, outside of Santa Fe. And, he, and it was horrible at first. And then after was the most enlightening he, he saw his higher self. He like met who he was. Yes. And from then on, I mean, his life changed dramatically. Wife left, kids left, haven't seen him, all this crazy stuff, but he's at peace with who he is. From that moment, he remembers that perspective. Why are we going in this direction? I'll tell I you. I don't know. You said the word trip. I know. Let's go on another trip real quick and look at the uh, painting. What about? What about the painting behind you? Oh, that one? Yeah, let's talk about your latest work. Uh, this is very special. This is a painting I'm doing from my roommate from SMU. We were roommates our senior year. We lived on, on what they called the Dallas Theology, DTS uh, apartment wing. It was full of these people that all went to college at Dallas Seminary. And it was really hard to get into. Like, it was owned by this lady from, uh, uh, she, she was one of the, she's best friends with the lady that invented the, the liquid paper. Anyway, anyway, so I forgot, she was very wealthy. Anyway, that's who, my landlady, she didn't need any money. So she kept the rent, it was $90 for a two bedroom, fully furnished with antiques, collectors, items, antiques. So that's Doug and I, Doug Mickey. He, Doug Mickey is now he's president for Chick-fil-A. Oh my God, there's a story there too, but I won't go into it at this point. There's a huge story there. But anyway, um, so he was also the best man at my wedding. And he called me up this year and said, I want a Wally painting. And usually when I get commissions, they tell me what room it's gonna go in. Or, I mean, Doug has four houses. So when I ask him what room, he says, what house? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, he's, anyway. Vice President Chick-fil-A, very wealthy. Okay, so he, I said, um, so what do you want the subject matter? He goes, I don't care. I just want a Wally painting. So that was, oh, you're making me sick. That's our cocktail. I've got our cocktail stuff right there. Do you see it ready to go? Look at you. I know. But anyway, so this is just a Wally painting, and it it's changed titles, but I'm not sure what it's going to be. Right now, I call it uh, New Life Sunset. 
but it's basically my backyard mm. because my backyard is like a fairyland. I don't know if you see any of the photos I post on my Facebook on my yard and yeah. my garden, but I, I I, this is yeah. my world right now, is my yard. And right now, this is what it really looks like to me. The sunset, the, 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 and I live right, I mean, I can, I'm set, when I sit in my desk in my living room, I can actually see the Missouri River and the mountains and right over the hill. I mean, that's my view. I live in the Garden of Eden. Okay, I do. Yeah, it's not North it's, Texas, right? Oh, hell no. I'm sorry. I like, the, I like Texas. I like Texas a lot. But I'll but, tell you, there, Sarah and I, uh, your daughter, were talking the other day about um, the, you know, the geography here. You just, there's not, there's shopping, uh, there's concrete, there's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of culture. I mean, it's, a, it's an appreciative place, right? But as far as getting out in five minutes and being in nature or whatever, you just, it takes a lot of effort. So to see that makes complete sense. And it's a total reflection of the things that I've seen you paint uh, over the years. And what a special piece to give your friend. Um, uh -huh. Speaking of friends and family, I told everybody tonight we're gonna do a double feature. So uh, we have the special honor of uh, somebody else that is a TCA alum. Uh, not only that, she's also Wally's daughter, one of a few. Her name is Sarah. <laughs> Sarah uh, is joining us tonight. Yeah, speaking of New York and traversing back to the uh, Dallas <laughs> metropolis. Hello, Sarah. Hey, how are you, Sam? Hey, Dad. Hey, honey. How you? You look beautiful. Oh, thank you. So, Sarah, what do you got going on back there? Um, I, first, I want to tell your story. Sure. And you can help me with your story. Um, so you. Grew up in Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. Went yes. Went to TCA. Mm -hmm. So I was 18, graduated from there. Graduated from there mm -hmm. and then hit the road. Tried to leave as, and go as far as possible. Yeah. So that was, um, uh, that was Philadelphia. I went to University of the Arts and I did musical theater there. But it was just because I love to dance and I like to act and I like to do music. So I... Figured why not to try, you know, just do everything all together. But did you get those, did you get those chops? Uh, well, that's a rhetorical question. You got your chops from your parents. But did, uh, what is Trinity, um, and you didn't take art, did you? You didn't take your I took art. one semester of art. With your dad? With my dad, who gave me a B. <laughs> yes. Because... He told me later that it's even though my work was actually probably maybe better than some of the other students, he knew exactly how much I worked on it. And I'm a little bit of a procrastinator. <laughs> oh, Dad. I knew I could get away with it. And oh. I guess I did it. But I was still voted most artistic in my class, which is crazy because I felt awful because for all the people who actually Jesus. were in the art program. But oh, my computer just went down. That's what happens when you get a B. So what? So then, how far did you okay. go? You went to New York, right? You're Philly, and then what? Philly, and then wait, let me fix this. And then, let's see, sorry, I had to move the computer. Um, and then I moved to New York in 2005, and I had I graduated college in 2000, and I was singing with a with a rock band. We're kind of like a theater nerds who are rock pop we were called 722 and it was me and my neighbors are they coming back are you guys coming back for a, we grand did a reunion we did a reunion show two years ago. but um there was so much fun yeah. there were amazing 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 musicians we were all music majors um and then me and one of the bass player he was a theater major so we mm -hmm. had a little combo a little um what did you say? Violent Femmes meets B-52s meets oh. weird, you know, like kind of quirky yeah. weird. Um, and then in 2005, I moved to New York, kind of hoping to expand the band a little bit. We played at CBGB's, played at the Knitting Factory. Um, we played uh, just some really cool shows. And then 
because I lived there, we ended up kind of just, we went to China actually on tour, which was fun. And uh, we ended up breaking up though, because we all started kind of doing our own thing. But then I started working in the restaurant business and that's kind of where I ended up. But Welcome to fine arts. Welcome to acting and uh music and everything look at my parents i got my mom is an amazing musician she played the harp she's a voice and theater teacher i have my dad who's a painter and can do photography everything so so did you i was doomed (laughs) you were you were uh so you're one of three sisters right the oldest of three you're the oldest of three and then you uh, consider yourself more sort of conservative and everything sort of lined up growing conservative, up? Conservative, I would say I'm yeah. probably the most my dad laughs, he's laughing yeah. um, I am probably the least conservative of all of the of all of the daughters but I was kind of yeah. always had my, my my you know stuff together yeah, always so growing up. Lined up. Everything was like, I, I got a plan here. And then I had a plan. I always was trying to do something, step it up. So when, when I worked in the restaurant business, well, I, I mean, uh, we'll get to that. But um, I, always, I worked for Bobby Flay, you know, and then I worked at the Modern for Danny Meyer, where I got a James Beard Award with the wine um, program there. And then the, my last job was, I always was trying to challenge myself and use, uh, because I love food and that's kind of my creative output. So what I do is I like to create cocktails and I love food and combining food and wine and cocktails and everything. Is, together. That, is that how you got the James Beard Award? Well, it's not personally mine, but it was with my, uh, at the restaurant, The Modern, uh, Danny Meyer at the MoMA at the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York. We got the James Beard Award for best wine service in the country. And I was very proud of that. So are you a mixologist? I hate that word. I, <laughs> I hate that word. No, I hate I... that word because it's so technical and it kind of almost puts a, like almost like a medical kind of feel to it. I'm, I always say I'm a bartender. I can talk to people. I can have a conversation, but I do love to create cocktails. So, no, yes, technically kind of like I'm a mixologist, but yeah. It's kind of, <laughs> I get it. I hear it a lot, and that's why I used it, because it just seemed appropriate. But at the same time, I hear the word resonates with me all the time, resonates. It seems pretentious a little bit to me. It seems, well, it's overused. Overused, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so mixologist would be like, yes, you're generalizing here, but I make fantastic beverages. What's going on behind you, by the way? Oh, so I decided to show you one of my cocktails that was from Dwayne Park. I worked at this amazing burlesque supper club in on the Bowery in Manhattan. Bowery is where burlesque started. All live music, all live performance. We had a between a four and a six piece band every night. Uh, World renowned performers there. And I had the privilege of being the beverage director there and creating the cocktails that were able to be not only beautiful, but delicious as well. So I decided to make you, if you want, or my dad, are you going to help me? Yeah, I got all this okay. stuff here. There all right, one of go. my little what? autumnal cocktails. Here. Okay, good. Go. And I'm doing a, an autumnal cocktail, I call it Red Roar. And it's a mezcal cocktail. So mezcal is, do you want me to do a little lesson here? (laughs) Mezcal is the smokier version of tequila. uh, Kind of, yes. It's not actually tequila. Uh, What they do is they smoke the leaves and everything underneath the ground. And so it's not technically uh, tequila, but it's in the same family. It's made with agave. So it's a mezcal cocktail. I make it with hibiscus or otherwise known as also jamaica in Mexico. And then with a little bit of oh, smoked uh, Himica. agave. Himica. That's what we Himica. do here. That's what we get here in Texas. Himica. Himica. I Himica. Yeah, I Himica tea, which is Whatever. a habitual flower tea. Not crazy. And then uh, <laughs> I have a little agave and uh, liquid smoke. I usually would make this actually with, I would smoke the agave myself with mesquite chips. But right. for this purpose... Um, so let me walk you through it. Yes. Okay, cool. Really simple. 
Okay. I'm I'm all about simple things, but I'm excuse me. It's not simple, Sarah. It's not simple at all. I don't know why. Wally's got that. his side to it, go and trying to make this at the same time. Really, this is taking me days to figure out how to do. This. <laughs> hold on, let me go. So hold on. Okay. Sorry, give me one second. I usually would have tongs or something to do this with. You want to? I have some. The, the home mind. bar. The home bar. So uh, this is the mezcal. Yep. Two parts mezcal. Wait, wait, wait. I don't Wally. have my shaker. This is my home shaker. Wally, this is uh, hibiscus tea. <laughs> what is that? Hibiscus tea. Gotcha. Okay. The tea that I made with the flowers. Got it. This is agave with a little bit of uh, liquid smoke in it. Mmm. How much liquid smoke? Uh, so it's two parts of the mezcal, two parts of the hibiscus tea, one part agave with a little couple drops of this uh, liquid smoke, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to do a couple of squeezes of fresh lime. Do you make this one up? This year, I make everything up. I do everything. Yeah, this is kind yeah, of where I... What I like to do, actually, while I'm making this, um, I like to go out to eat... From, I used to try, especially in New York, one of the things that I miss is that you can go there's you can go to a new restaurant every day there or if you really wanted to. Not anymore. Unfortunately, a lot of places have closed. But I would try to go to one new place a week, either being fine dining or be a hole in the wall. So I go out to eat. I would try some fun dishes, whatever it was, and I would go home and either make – try to remake what I had at the restaurant or try to create a cocktail that's inspired by it. So this is kind of just inspired by like smelling the smoke and when you're out eating, like, and it's got that barbecue kind of smell to it. Let me go. I have to grab ice. I'll be right back. So can you hear me? Yeah. Can yeah. hear that? Oh, I, no. <laughs> by the way, while she's doing that, I went when I was in New York last summer. I got to watch her do her thing. She was quite amazing Just because you can tell she's a she integrates her ballet, which as a dancer, her theater and her performance and the bar, and then her creativity with art. And she's surrounded by music, so it's kind of a fabulous thing to watch. Sarah, she's she's really the top. I was quite. Yeah. Thank and you I don't mean it easily. Proud dad. So, this is going to be loud for a second. I just got to shake it. Shake, shake it. And since I don't have a regular shaker here yet, I'm still making my new home here. Yeah, so Sarah moved back to Dallas from New yes. York. Yes. Just, I'm sure, like, I got to go back. Uh, well, unfortunately, um, my restaurant, as well as many restaurants, closed because of COVID. Yeah. And uh, we're not, we unfortunately can't open anytime soon because it is inside and it's live performance. And uh, there's just some amazing performers that these, these aren't struggling artists that are, have lost their jobs. These aren't people that were looking to work. These are people who were working every day, six, seven days a week, who are professionals. I have friends who worked at the Metropolitan Opera. I have friends who are on Broadway. And a lot of people aren't working. And most people aren't working right now. So unfortunately, because of that, and as sad as it is, but I'm here with my family now, <clears throat> trying to find my new, my new path. So um, your next streak is called What's Next? <laughs> it's gonna make. Invent. Um, you've already found it, haven't you? So the last little step is a little bit of smoked salt and sugar in the raw. So you get that salty. I like to do salty and sweet together. Love it. And then let's see how it turns out. It's got that beautiful ah. red. Dad, you going in? You got it. Are you still shaking? Shake it up. Shake it like a Polaroid picture, Dad. Yeah, take it like a bow right picture. I got that song. Okay. <laughs> now, mine is going to be different because my hibiscus did not work the way it's supposed to. But I'm going to test it. There it is. This all, she says this is simple. I mean, this so is, good. You know, 
Is I love this drink. Major. Ah. Oh. It's okay. nice when you actually like something that you do too. You know. I know. Well, I loved I loved her drinks. They're beautiful. They were. She had her drinks photographed for some magazine shots, right, Sarah? Well, the first cocktail that I created for Dwayne Park, I called it the Gypsy Rose Lee. Gypsy Rose was one of the original burlesque performers, and everyone knows the musical Gypsy. So I'm a musical theater person. Uh, but what I did is I took fresh rose petals and made a syrup from them. Uh, it was an inspiration from a gimlet. So oh. gin, lime juice, sugar. So what I did is gin with a rose syrup and then fresh cucumbers muddled and then you do the fresh rose petals in it it was a beautiful cocktail so but we had lots of lots of bachelorette parties lots of ladies who like to get really dressed up and come to train park and so what better than to drink a cocktail with rose petals in it so but this is the red roar cheers cheers do you know what's really big here in texas right now i'm sure you've seen this is ranch water you know what that is Ranch water, yes. My, I do it. it makes you, if you drink it, you get sick, I thought. My cousin is actually friends with them. I actually just started following them. The one, the little cans with the, that are like the tequila and soda. Is that what you're talking about? Now they started bottling it, right? But it was originally Topa Chico, a lot of lime, okay. vodka, salt. Right. Okay. Very simple, but right. it, it, then people start bottling it, right? Okay, okay. But I know there's a, a canned version the of it now. Time you, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that's what happens after a summer of uh, quarantine. People, you know, get after the uh, Topa <laughs> Chico. And to get, yes, Topa Chico, we don't have in New York. So I actually, that's a Texas thing. I remember several years ago when I went to New York and I walked in a bar and I said, do you guys have Tito's? They're like, what is that? Well, I'm not going to say, but... Huge, right? We, I had to beg to get Tito's because it is actually one of the most called uh, vodkas, and uh, but it's great, and I love that it's from Texas. But we didn't have it a long time at my restaurant, but we finally got it. So yeah, go Texas. Okay. What did you say, Wally? What was that? Uh, I was gonna say that I thought I forgot, Sam. Me too. I, forgot. I totally so forgot. You're, you're hibiscus. That's what did it. Just Let me see you. yours, Dad. I don't know what I was, Sam, I remembered. Flip, I am not, the, the last time I had a drink, because I don't drink anymore. Mm -hmm. anyway, the last time I had a drink was two years ago when I was, oh, no, I had one with Sarah last summer, never mind. And then two years ago, the last one in Dallas with Kristen Cruz. No way. And yes, and it was at JR's that gay bar down in the corner of Cedar Springs and Throckmorton. Yeah, and we sat out on the balcony and I tell you, we had shots of tequila. Oh, I, had, oh. I don't know what she drank. I, I just had two uh, shots of tequila, but that's the last time I've had any alcohol wait, since Sarah. And then I had one in her place and then this one. Let's see what yours looks like. I want to compare the two here. Okay, so there. Uh, so I would people. actually... I like to make it the, the hibiscus really strong. I know, but I told you my hibiscus. Look at it. I told you I messed it up, Sarah. I called when I talked to it. Look at it. It's hard. You should have added more water to it. I know. Though. I know. Yeah, like, no. oh I said fill the whole container up. This, you know my favorite part about this you. is? It's okay. Now you know. Now no, you know. Oh, my God. Yeah, like, Sarah. Sarah. But anyway. Hey, Sarah. That's why you need me to make your cocktails for you. Sarah, guess what? Whatever. What'd you say, Sam? I said, Sarah, you get to give your dad a B tonight. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Sam. Giving you a B. Ooh, uh, geez, a plus. She's given me F before, I promise hey, you. Sarah, let me ask you a question. What so yeah. you mentioned a second ago, and I love your story and I love uh where you've come. Um what what so what is next, Sarah? What is uh what are you are you just kind of open to the world? I am actually for the first time in my life. Um, I don't have a plan and kind of just seeing where God takes me and like where are the next, what the next step is for me. And um, I think kind of just being open to it is kind of very scary, first of all, but it 
is going to allow me to actually be more creative. I've been mm. working. I mean, I love to cook. I've been pickling some things and making some jams and fun things like that. I've also been working on some creative stuff to help learning things. Like I've been writing some songs for my nephew who just turned four. So I'm going to try to record those and work on some kids music. I feel like that uh, it might be a fun learning experience, but he's, he comes, I'll write a song for him about washing his hands or something. And he'll uh, ask me whenever he sees me, he goes, come to the, come to the bathroom, sing the song with me. Like you to wash his hands. So, you know, we'll see, maybe that's my next thing. Who knows? And I'm okay with that. So. That's fantastic. Can I ask you guys, uh, uh, um, I just thought of this every month to have, Wally, I don't know how often you do your commission work. It doesn't matter. We can talk about the works you've done. How about uh, painting and a drink? Um, oh, yeah. Okay. I have, I, you know. I have a conversation every uh, month or so. You and I, we can get together, have a cocktail, talk art, talk life, where we get, where we're going. Oh, my God, get- Sam. I would love that, Sam. I would love that. We got to have some good music going on. I, you know, at this point, we're grassroots, so no one cares about royalties. I'll edit that out. <laughs> we're going to listen to some good music. We're going to make sure we see where we're going. What, what, do you, what music do you like? I, I like, I, I can't. You said everything. So, you know, my I mean, background. That sounds obnoxious, but I do. You don't know, my background, I was trained jazz trombone. I play, I started off trained jazz trombone. I was teaching it in college. And then I went, I started, I learned the guitar when I lived in Madrid. And then I started writing and I've been playing the piano since I was four. The, wow. Seriously, the first, so, and then there's a whole story I write. I saw on one of my blogs about the organ and my parents, Sarah knows all about that, that huge organ in my parents' living room. Yes, yeah, so they hated for me to play. Yeah, They wouldn't allow me to play it either, but of course I did every time my dad was at work or at camp or on drill or whatever he was doing. But yeah, I snuck up. I snuck, my biggest sin was getting caught on the, we're playing the organ and the piano in the house. So did you know uh, a guy named Art Pepper, jazz musician? No, but his name I know. I don't stumped, know him. I, it stumped me too, and I found him uh, from a TV show called Bosch. If you haven't seen that, it's a really good show. I've heard of that. He's a big jazz guy. Art Pepper, check him out. But I grew up with jazz. My dad was a jazz. He grew. He went to UT on the GI Bill and ended up being a jazz uh, DJ down in Temple, Texas. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we have SMU and jazz in common now. Yeah, for sure. We can go, we can go deep oh, in the wow. rock and roll jazz. Uh, but yeah, so everything, you know, that's the basis of everything. It doesn't matter what, but I, I do. It's I math. Love music. It's I math. Just love music. Yeah. It's math. It's math. Yeah. Math is the basis for everything. Math is the basis for music and especially jazz. We were talking Jazz, this, guy was on NPR the other, this guy was on NPR the other day and he was talking about studying under Miles Davis. Oh, wow. And, and, and he said, <laughs> uh, yeah, he said he came in, he, he brought me in. They said, there's this new cat that's, that's doing really good and they needed someone to fill it on the set uh, on trumpet. And it was said, Miles Davis? It was Miles. It was, it was a guy working with Miles Davis. Oh, and, God. And, You're and, kidding and, me. And Miles said, as you know, and uh, is the, the nuances, the transitions and things like yeah. that. He said, you got, let me teach you those because you got all the melody and bass and you know, mm-hmm. your basics, everything. And he said, this guy, Miles Davis tripped me out. And he was in New Orleans at the time. So he said, yeah, I want you to come on the road with us after that. But to get a shot like that. He, is, wait, wait, stop. He asked you to go on the road with him? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, no. I was listening okay, to Okay, he asked a friend that you were telling this story. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to get yeah, straight. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, yeah. wait, wait, back up. Okay, yeah. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's go into music next time. Uh, okay. Because I, we, can, we can dive deep. And I don't want to take up you guys on the evening. Plus, you got to drink that beautiful drink uh, you have. Who right knows what's going to happen afterwards, Sam? Because, like I said, I haven't. 
I've had <laughs> one drink. I've had two drinks in two years. So this is my third. So we'll see. So number four, let's talk about October if you want to come down. Hopefully everybody's playing it safe. And if you come yes. down, you, Sarah, and I can uh, do this live, not live, but we can do it around. I got a huge farm table, big open kitchen. So I live in a mid-century modern house but built in the 50s. No way. It's totally groovy. Right across oh from Ely Elementary on Royal. Oh, Where yeah. Elementary is. Yeah. Oh, my God, yes. I know exactly why I used to live right there at uh, University and uh, – um, uh, what was that street at Wallen Hill? Oh, not Wallen Hill. Uh, Preston. Preston okay. and you're just down the road. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We got hit uh, by the tornado last year. Yeah, it's real close. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but uh, well, that's awesome. We'll we'll do that. Okay. I'm but, down. I'll cook and I'll I'll make a drink. How about that, down, Sarah? Yes, yeah. I'm definitely down. Okay, so this is a monthly thing. You need thing. to ask or Sarah her. to do yeah. her. I want to hear Sarah sing Fever oh. by Madonna. So, <laughs> so, so one, one last thing before we leave. Uh, I just learned from Wally, Sarah's amazing dad, and Sarah is his amazing daughter. She's a badass. Um, that she's going to close us out tonight with a little Madonna song. <gasps> just a few bars, hopefully. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> what Fever. am I doing? Fever. Well, that's actually an old classic. Uh, I know, I know, but you did it. Uh, I think. I've seen you do it like Madonna that one time. That was when I was like 18, Dad. I'm 42. I that. <laughs> that was a but I will do it for, song. I guess I'll say a little bit. So Sarah, pick a song and we're going to, I mean, if that's not it. I'll uh, do it. I'll do a fever a little. I'll do a verse. All right, here comes Sarah. We're gonna close Never know how much I love you. Never know how much I care When you put your arms around me You get a fever that's so hard to bear You give me fever Ooh, with your kisses Fever when you hold me tight Fever in the morning Fever all through the night Nice Sarah, Wally much love, you guys. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you, Sam. Guys. See you next time. We'll be here. Okay. For sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.